Benvenuti al CICAP Fest, eh, la nostra ospite di oggi è Natalia Pasternak, microbiologa, presidente dell'Istituto Kestau de Scienza, che vuol dire domande di scienza, un'organizzazione non profit brasiliana dedicata alla promozione del pensiero scientifico e del pensiero critico, che ha molte affinità con il CICAP, in particolare per la sua missione di opposizione alla spesa pubblica per trattamenti inefficaci e pseudoscientifici. Natalia è anche stata direttore del Festival della Scienza Pint of Science in Brasile, nel 2020 ha organizzato il primo corso di specializzazione in comunicazione pubblica della scienza nella città di Sao Paulo. L'abbiamo invitata al CICAP Fest non solo per le affinità culturali che ci legano, che legano il CICAP al suo istituto, ma per capire insieme a lei che cosa succede in un paese quando le autorità pubbliche, invece di spiegare quello che sta succedendo alla luce della scienza, in una condizione di emergenza come è stata la pandemia da Covid-19, disseminano notizie false e aumentano l'incertezza. So we start from here, Natalia. Welcome to Chicap Fest. What happened in Brazil in the last year and a half? Thank you so much for having me on board. It's a pleasure to be here at the Chicap Fest. And uh, what happened in Brazil was... Well, Bolsonaro happened in Brazil, and then COVID happened. And this combination proved to be really deadly for Brazilian population, uh, mainly because Bolsonaro's government was already, and that's before the pandemic, well, Bolsonaro's government was already a denialist government. Uh, the, uh, its, uh, its ministers were renowned climate change deniers. Bolsonaro himself fired the head of our own uh, our space institute, INPI, in Brazil because he didn't like the data about deforestation. So the government was already a denialist government even before the pandemic hit. And then came COVID. And during the COVID pandemic, this denialist government denied the pandemic. So what happened in Brazil was several types of denialism that really put the population in danger. First, the government started by denying the severity of the pandemic itself. So, oh no, it's just a minor flu. It's not that grave. We don't have to worry about it. Then it moved on to denying the need for preventive measures. Oh, there's no need for social distancing. This will ruin the economy. What's this thing about masks? Are you a sissy? There's no need for mask wearing. So the, the, the government denies the severity of the pandemic and denies the need for preventive measures. Then, as a surprise to all Brazilians, because Brazil has a very strong tradition of vaccination, the government denies the need for vaccines, the need to purchase vaccines in advance and to plan a vaccination program. So we didn't plan ahead for a good vaccination program and we had all the capacity to, to install one of the best vaccination programs in the world because we have a great tradition of public vaccination here in Brazil. But the federal government denied the need to plan that in advance. So we are lagging behind in vaccination. And finally, the government denied scientific evidence while promoting miracle cures for COVID-19. 
our government is the only in the world who still promotes hydroxychloroquine and what they call the early treatment, which involves a lot of unproven medications for COVID-19. And this is promoted by the federal government and by the Ministry of Health as a public policy, a health policy in Brazil. So it's a lot of denialism that puts Brazil in a very vulnerable position, because if you deny the pandemic, if you deny the need for vaccines, the need for preventive measures, and you brand, oh, here's the miracle cure, you deny that the, that the pandemic even exists. So why bother? And here we are with over uh, 500 million dead. This 500, is the question. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> We that that's that's the question that everybody is asking outside of Brazil. How can you deny something that is such self-evident? Because I think that Brazil was hit, but by hidden by such a strong uh, pandemic outbreak with a lot of very even dramatic cases, like in the city of Manaus. What happened in the public opinion and how they reacted to this kind of uh, fake news, actually, that were spread by the government? I think public opinion is shifting. It's slowly realizing that there's no denying the pandemic because it's, it, it should be very rare today that a single Brazilian doesn't have a relative or a friend who died of COVID. So it's really harder to deny what's in front of you. But we have to realize and walking with science communication, I think we all realize that there are people who actually believe that the earth is flat. So they deny evidence that's really in front of our noses saying that of course the earth is not flat. So there, there are very uh, subtle mechanisms of helping people deny evidence, deny reality. And this happens in all, uh, uh, in all kinds of scientific knowledge, not only COVID, it happens with flat earth, it happens with evolution, it happens with vaccines. So it's not new how denialism works. We know that it works. We know that there are lots of conspiracy theories that help people keep their denialism. And I think this is what's still happening in Brazil, but to a lesser degree. Uh, the public opinion is shifting. Uh, trust in the government is shifting. We had a lot of public manifestations against the government recently. So I think people are starting to realize that they have been fooled. Uh, we know from studies that in general, uh, this very strong denialism of uh, evidence uh, is uh, uh, luckily uh, uh, a problem of a minority of, this, of the people. Um, do you think that when uh, fake news come from, uh, uh, let's say, an official source, this fosters this kind of denialism. What's the impact of such uh, misinformation? It's huge. When misinformation comes from the federal government itself, it comes from the national institutions, it becomes much harder to fight back because you are fighting against the original source of information that the public should trust. I mean, if you are not going to trust what the Ministry of Health of your country says, you've got a big problem because you have to educate people to say, well, I'm sorry, but you cannot trust government information right now. And this is not only a scientific crisis. This is a crisis in democracy. So it becomes a much, a much larger problem than only scientific evidence. And, and of course, I think it, it generates a lot of mistrust and a lot of conspiracy theories. And we, when we talk about minorities, yes, we know that all these uh, denialist movements, they are fostered by minorities, but these minorities can be very loud. And when they are backed by federal institutions, they become louder. Um. Yeah, I, I perfectly understand this. What I was wondering is if uh, we are talking here in Chicago Fest about uncertainty. Do you think that the uncertainty that was around this pandemic helped, uh, let's say, the denialist movement? And how can you deal with uncertainty when you communicate science? We really have to 
be careful on how we communicate uncertainty to the public because to us scientists and science communicators we are very used to dealing with uncertainty science is about uncertainty it's not about certainty it couldn't be because we are always investigating so we have to be careful to communicate science as a process a process of investigation and in this process we are not going to deal with dogmas we are not going to deal with certainties but this is difficult to communicate because the public likes to deal with certainties they like to be told but is this right or wrong how should i behave if i behave like this am i going to get COVID? What should I do to prevent it? Or what do you mean you don't know exactly? So uh, when we talk about uncertainty, we have to be very humble to, uh, to explain how science works and why uncertainty is our friend. It's what leads us to discoveries. And it's not about what we don't know, but what, uh, uh, what it's about what we are investigating. And while investigating, there's a lot of knowledge that we've accumulated since the beginning of March uh, 2020. So we do have a lot of information on how COVID works, how the virus infects the cells, uh, what preventive measures really work, why vaccines work and why we know they're safe. There's a lot of information that we can share with the public that we already uncovered but uncertainty is a part of science and this has to be communicated not only by the media and by science communicators but even at the doctor's office uh, people really trust their medical doctors but they they are used to being told what to do here take this medicine take this vaccine if you do this you won't get sick and now we're at a time where communicating uncertainty is about transparency. It's about honesty. So the doctor has to be prepared, has to be trained to talk to the patient and to explain, here's what we know and here's what we don't know. So we know that vaccines work and they, they will prevent death, hospitalization and severe illness, but we are not 100% sure that they will prevent contagion. So you still have to wear a mask. You still have to be careful around other people. This is about transparency. And if we try to communicate uncertainty together with transparency, I think then we have good tools to communicate with the lay people. Do you think there is a cultural determinant uh, that makes the difference in communicating uncertainty between countries to countries? I mean, uh, do you think there are countries that are more prone to believe in authorities and so they deal uh, with, uh, they, they are not used to deal with uncertainty because they, they expect from their doctors or uh, their institutions to have certainty. Let's say countries with a more paternalistic approach to the citizens. While there are other countries that have a quite different approach that trained their citizens to change their mind. Do you think this is something that has an impact and how it impacted in Brazil? I'm no political scientist, so I don't know if I'm the right person to address this particular topic, but uh, I would say there's two sides of it. Uh, for instance, the more democratic a country is, of course, the more its citizens feel free to make their own choices. This can be a good thing, but it can either be very, uh, it can either be very dangerous for people to realize that uh, science is about opinion and it's not. So uh, I think it, it, it's, it's a tricky, um, it's a tricky field to go into. While on the other hand, if you take uh, countries that are not uh, traditionally democratic, you can say, okay, so these people, the, they don't come from a democratic country, say, so they are not used to speak their minds or change their minds. They are used to really trust in what the government says. 
uh, it's usually seen as a very bad thing, and it is for creativity, for freedom, for freedom of speech, and even for scientific thinking. But on the other hand, maybe these countries have a better uh, outcome when implementing preventive measures because people will follow. So I think that there's two sides of this that that maybe. Um, uh, I think that a political scientist would be more capable than I am to judge uh, which we can take to our advantage and what we couldn't. Yes, the reason why I ask this is because I read one of your pieces uh, where you uh, ask for a better training of doctors Uh, to deal with uh, with uh, what is evidence in medicine, which is something if you want uh, that uh, a patient uh, takes uh, for granted that their doctors are able to distinguish between what is evidence and what uh, is just an opinion and what is an ongoing knowledge. Is this really an issue of the medical community and, uh, and did the pandemic highlight this uh, lack of training? In Brazil, I think, yes. I think the pandemic really highlighted the importance of teaching evidence-based medicine in our medical schools here in Brazil and providing our doctors, both young and experienced, with training in evidence-based medicine, because there are many, many doctors in Brazil who really embrace the so-called early treatment with the unproven medications. And then of course, as a patient, you go to your doctor, the doctor prescribes all kinds of medications. You assume that the doctor knows what they're doing. And in this situation, there's a great deal of doctors in Brazil who actually don't know what they're doing. I, I am sure that they want what's best for their patient. Uh, I think they're doing it because they really believe that the early treatment works, but it proves that they are not well trained to assess evidence. So I think uh, that, yeah, the pandemic highlighted a very fragile spot in our medical schools training. Yeah, in Italy, we are facing almost the same. We have a quite strong movement for early treatments, uh, a movement of doctors uh, asking to be recognized for early treatments. And in this so-called protocol, there are a lot of non-evidence-based treatments, of course. I think the protocol is almost the same in every country. Uh, so this opens a new, um, a new issue in dealing with this kind of uncertainty, which is what is the role of uh, science journalists and science communicators in explaining this kind of issues. You organize the training course for journalists. So my question is, as journalists, we trust in experts. We, we use experts as a source, of course, not the only source, but we use experts as a source. How, how should we be, behave in such a situation? The best advice that I would give to journalists is that science is not like politics or like economics where you have two sides or different opinions. When you talk about sources and experts, of course, you, you have to rely on experts when you're a journalist. But when you're talking about science journalism, you have to realize that you have to trust scientific consensus and you have to trust scientific consensus over your sources. You cannot show science as opinions, as two sides. So I'm going to interview one doctor who's in favor of hydroxychloroquine and one doctor who's against it. First of all, no one is against medications. We are all in favor of evidence-based medications. So no one is against the use of this or that. And that's not a very good way to put it because you put it like it's a war or if it's two doctors bickering about the, the, the medication that they disagree on. And this, uh, this gives the public a sense of false equivalence as if it were just opinion based. So, oh, okay, one doctor thinks this medication is good and the other thinks uh, uh, the medication is no good. So it's all a matter of opinion and the science is unsettled. No, the science is already settled, the debate 
is not between two individuals. The debate in science is in written peer reviewed articles that are submitted to the scientific community scrutiny and they will reach a scientific consensus. If you take all the history of hydroxychloroquine since March last year, this debate is already closed. The debate happened. Lots of papers were published. Lots of clinical trials, randomized clinical trials were published. And the consensus reached by the scientific community is that this medication doesn't work for COVID. So there is no more reason to debate. And there is no more reason for journalists to show both sides of a history. There are no sides. There is scientific consensus. The same as scientific consensus about climate change or about evolution or about vaccines. So you are not going to interview uh, a flat earther to show his opinion or her opinion alongside an astronomer or astrophysicist. It's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of scientific consensus. And this is what science journalism should focus on. Um, so now you, I know that you are spending a couple of years in New York at Columbia University. So what are your, what is the lesson learned for you from this uh, one year and a half in dealing with these issues? And from where would you start in, in your society, but also in Italy to uh, fix the issue, to avoid another another crisis in information like the one we faced? Well, I think the, the take home lesson from the pandemic is really about the need for a better science communication and risk communication. We've seen a lot of institutions, even the World Health Organization, trying to deal with science communication and they were totally unprepared to do that. Sometimes they gave interviews without realizing that the whole world was listening and they had to choose their words very carefully to convey the right message that they wanted to. So I think the pandemic made us all realize the importance of a good science communication with the public. And most of all, and this is what I'm going to walk, uh, to focus my work here in Colombia, the, uh, the importance of global policies for health and for these global policies to be science-based. We need uh, an international community uh, of scientists to try to work together on science-based global policies for health, for the environment, for, for, for science uh, communication and information so that we can, uh, we can be ready for the next emergency, for the next global emergency. And, and we learn how to communicate it globally and to deal with it uh, based on science and help each country organize scientific advisors to governments. Because the many, many countries, for, for instance, how many countries actually have uh, in the cabinet a, a chief scientific office? I that's think a couple. I yeah, think I couple. think it's about a dozen, a dozen countries in the world that actually have an office prepared to, to advise the government, to advise the president and the minister, uh, the health ministry on what science says about that particular issue. So this is something that I want to, de to develop here in Colombia. And by the way, we're talking about uncertainty, which is the theme for CHICAP this year. Uh, uh, I'm here by invitation of uh, Dr. Stuart Firestein, who actually wrote a book called Uncertainty. So uh, I think this is what we want to, to work on. Uh, the, uh, uncertainty, failure, which was uh, the theme for his other book, and how to communicate the uncertainty of science, but especially how to communicate and to implement science-based global policies, especially when it comes to health, because we are going to face another emergency like this. We know this is not our last pandemic. We're probably going to be in the situation again, and we have to be better prepared. 
So you are working from the top, which means global policies, but global policies then has to be accepted by local government and by the citizens. So do you think that there is a role for, uh, let's say, a non-profit organization like Chico, but also like your institute in Brazil? And how should those organizations work with the people? Our organizations, CHICAP and my institute, Question of Science in Brazil, all NGOs uh, that work with science communication and science popularization, I think we are bridges. We are the ones who can bridge the public to policymakers and to the academia, to scientists, because we are the ones that are best prepared to translate science to the public in a way that they can follow and understand and become interested and become part of it. Because we learned in this pandemic that we, you don't control a disease that depends on human behavior without explaining to people how they should behave and to get in them to voluntarily behave in a way that favors the outcome of the pandemic. So it's about collaboration and we need the public to collaborate, but we are only going to get this collaboration from the public if we take the effort to explain science in a way that they can understand. And I think this is what our organizations do best. So we have to build these bridges and we have to keep them going. Thank you very much, Natalia. It was very interesting to have this chat with you and we really hope to have you in person in Padova next year. <laughs> so do I. It will be much nicer and a very good excuse for me to visit Italy again. <laughs> Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you.